and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Of all the fishing holes Deputy Dingle and I had to visit today, this had to be the one we dipped our lines into. Now, I know what you're thinking. Just exactly how many fishing holes are there in the humble county of Split Tail? Well, the God's honest truth is, not that many more than this one I'm referring to. And by that, I mean this is the only one. So I suppose my lamenting about this particular fishing hole doesn't hold much water after all. And that's no pun in case you were wondering, because the deputy and I are consummate professionals, and you'd be hard-pressed to catch us cracking a joke while we're on the clock. You'd be harder-pressed than the creases in the deputy's tan slacks, and even if you did press that hard, you still wouldn't catch us goofing around on company time. Fishing a little, maybe or playing a little mini golf here and there, time permitting. Maybe having a hot dog or two, but joking around? Heaven forbid. If there's one thing I've learned in all my years of law enforcement, it's this. There's no room for funny business when it comes to law and order. Even in a county whose chief export is funny business, whose planning metrics from above form a cartoon wiener, with its sole fishing hole down by the left nut. You'd think that as the one and only fish hole in Split Tail, that the body of water would have earned itself an official name. But if it has, I've not been made aware of it. Most people just call it the fishing hole. That's not to imply it's much good for fishing, because it sure as hell isn't. Like most of the unfamiliar faces in Split Tail County, I figure most of the fish that pass through here are doing just that just passing through. And like most familiar faces, the odd fish you do catch tends to look a little funny. Funny enough that you probably wouldn't eat it. It was a sweltering hot day in Split Tail, right smack in the middle of summer. Deputy Dingle and I were standing right on the edge of that aforementioned fishing hole with a couple of drop lines, just open to catch whatever we could catch. There seemed to be a temperature at which your typical ne'er-do-well shut down operations for the day, and today's temperature met and exceeded it. And that's not to say these people were doing yeoman's work, mind you. It's only to suggest that on such a sweltering hot day in Split Tail, even the lowest among us, the most lewd and lascivious, the low lives and the libertines, the disenfranchised and the disenchanted were just too hot to do anything all that bad. Or so we thought, anyway. I think I feel something, Sheriff, Dingle said. It didn't strike me right away that Dingle was referring to his fishing line. Maybe because I was so deep in thought at that moment, I thought the deputy might have been having some kind of a spiritual breakthrough. I got something on the line, Sheriff. What's that, Deputy? I think I caught a fish. Mmm, feels too heavy for a sunny. Well, goddamn. Dingle started reeling in the line, making little figure eights over his hand and elbow with the nylon wire. It definitely looked too heavy to be a sunny. It got to the point where I had to help him pull the rest of it in. And when we did... Something like a gray, bloated bag began to surface in the murk. It wasn't long before I was able to identify the bag as not a bag at all, but the back and ass of a human being. Dingle must have made the connection around the same time I did, because I could hear him start gagging. The deputy, you see, has a bit of a delicate stomach. Good God! He said. I think that's a human being, Sheriff. Well, Deputy, I think you might be right about that. I think you might be just about 100% right. And furthermore, on top of that, I'm not at all assured about this fella's well-being. I picked up a nearby stick and poked the prone figure in his exposed ash cheek. The flesh was soft, waterlogged. 
There were weird bubbles forming in the water from around where I poked them. What say, fella? I asked. How's the water? I received no answer to either the question or the pokes with the stick. Relative to what my own response would be if someone poked me in the ass with the stick, I gathered the swimmer was either extremely agreeable or dead. The deputy must have drawn the same conclusion, because he looked nearly as pale as the swimmer's ass. Deputy, pending a formal diagnosis, I think this man is deceased. I'd say so, Sheriff. You recognize the man? Well, not by his ass. To be fair, I usually look a man in the face when I speak to him. See if you can turn him around for me, deputy. Oh, Sheriff? Ain't there supposed to be special people who do things like that? You mean to turn around a dead fella? I mean to handle a body, Sheriff. Why do I gotta touch it? He's just had a bath, deputy. Just go ahead and nudge him around so we can have a look at him. Undamn dignified. Dingle didn't even try to conceal his distaste. So immensely dignified is my fire deputy, it sometimes dampens his enthusiasm for police work. He is obedient, though, so he squatted by the edge of the pond and reached out to grab one of the fella's arms. Once the body started teetering around, though, the front end proved no more helpful than the back. Oh, shit! Dingle said. Predictably, he turned away the barf. Settle down, deputy. You're gonna scare away the fish. His head's gone, Sheriff. What the hell happened to it? Hmm. You mean the head or the guy? Because I've got no idea where the head's gone to. But as far as what happened to the man, I'd place the cause of death as his head came off. But how, Sheriff? Hmm. I let the fella bob around until I could see the wound. I guess that's what you'd call it, hoping for a clue to the manner of removal. But the meat there was so waterlogged and fish nibbled, you'd be hard-pressed to guess at it. As not only the high sheriff, but chief forensic medical examiner of Split Tail, I was pretty hard-pressed myself. I'm leaning toward natural causes, deputy. What? Sheriff, this man's been murdered. I was afraid he'd say that. If there's one thing I've learned about police work over the decades, it's this. Bad stuff is gonna happen whether we see it or we don't. So it's usually best to pretend you never did. But once the dreaded M word is uttered, it's implied you ought to have a look into it a little bit. Not to do so would be bad form, even on a perfectly nice day like today. Well, maybe you're right, deputy. You got any leads? The deputy stared dumbly for a moment, then started patting his pockets. Not fishing leads, deputy. If we're going to conduct a murder investigation, we're going to need leads. Meaning we're going to have to talk to some people and ask them some questions. Problem is, we don't know who to ask or where to start. Well, we could check down there, Sheriff. Dingle pointed off a ways down the path along the fishing hole. I didn't see anything at first, but after looking for a moment, there was a little curl of smoke coming out from the brush. Well, goddamn, I think you've got our first lead, deputy. Why don't we moor off our friend here and go have a looky? Dingle wrapped his drop line around the stump and we set off through the brush. Closer, we saw the source of the smoke, a makeshift yurt with walls stitched out of blankets and old flannel shirts. By a small campfire sat a sun-baked old man, a river rat, who, like the water itself, must have quit his meandering and settled here. When the deputy and I came into his clearing, he regarded us like two aliens, the whites of his eyes a stark contrast against his filthy old hide. Morning, sir, I said. Sheriff Ball and Deputy Dingle, Split Tail County Sheriff's Department. We'd like to ask you a couple of questions regarding an incident that took place nearby. The man tilted his head like some kind of curious animal. He said, Monza, Monza, that about me now. I'm not going on around here. <laughs> what you got? A pause. On the nearby fire sat a rusty old skillet with some inomitable creature sizzling in it. It looked to have come from the water, but was nearly evolved to walk up out of it. He says, good morning, and that's fine with him. He's not all that busy, Dingle said. 
You understood that, deputy? My daddy was a yurt person, Sheriff. Well, goddamn. Look at him. Sorry I ain't got no more grub for us, boys. That's the only thing I got all mom. We now and out some wild, you know, through our lives and more. You know, that's how they all buy four hours. Look at that cow. A little bit of a... They're going to lie. And they're going to say, oh, got something now. Got something now. And you're know, pulling me in. That's what he did right there. Sorry, boys. Got enough for the three. Well, I'm going to cook them up. Yum, yum. Eat them up. He says, sorry, he doesn't have enough lunch for all three of us. Otherwise, he'd let us have a hunk of his nice fish there. Oh, well, that's all right, sir. I thank you for your kindness. But if I'm being completely honest with you, as I assume you intend to be with us, I'm not altogether convinced that what you've got there is precisely a fish. The man looked confused. Now that I'd gotten a closer look at the thing in the pan, it very well might have been some kind of shoe. In any case, I went on, would you happen to know anything about a fella nearby who might have drowned in the lake and lost his head? Not necessarily in that order. The man's eyes lit up. Cool! I ripped down that mud, boy! <laughs> come on in there, boy. Come on, come on, come on. He opened the flap to his yurt and waited for us to follow him in. Already a kind of acrid stink was billowing out of the yurt and Dingle's Adam's apple was a-bobbin. Oh, uh, what did he say, deputy? He says he's got something inside that might help us, but I don't want to go in there, Sheriff. Well, I suppose I could have gone in there by myself, but since this whole thing was Dingle's fault, it didn't seem right to let him off the hook so easy. He'd gone and hooked the body, he'd gone and uttered the M-word, and now he was on the hook himself. Let's not be impolite, deputy. Polite, respectful, and professional. That's our motto, ain't it? I'm surprised at you, deputy. Dingle huffed. He took a big, deep breath, and we followed the man into the yurt. Inside was about 20 degrees hotter than outside, and smelled like something scientifically engineered to stink. The deputy was visibly reconsidering our motto. The man went into a pile of stuff in the corner and produced a dish with a big lump on it. Turning back into the lantern light, the lump revealed itself to be a human head. This he presented to us with a flourish, somewhere between a yurt dweller and a French sommelier. Hmm, y'all are here. <laughs> hmm. Well, goddamn. You see that, Dingle? Dingle? The deputy's Adam's apple was going up and down like a fishing bobber. I scrutinized the half-crazy yurt dweller with his head on a dish, but my keen intuition told me he had hardly been the one to commit this crime. In fact, if there was one thing I'd learned in all my decades of law enforcement, it was this. No one cut a man's head off just to keep it as a souvenir. If a souvenir was what you were after, you were going to want something smaller and more manageable. Which brought me to my next question. Sir? Where exactly did you get your hands on that? And while we're on the subject, why'd you bring it home and put it on a dish? Well, I weren't going down there to money, but I was a little bit hungry and I'd get a little grub. I had to run down there and just now there was somebody looking right back at me. I said, Ooh, what else? What's going on down there, boy? I'm going to run down there and grab it. You ever did the head? I said, Ooh, I got going to run down there and say, Blow. I went up through the earth. Hm. Put it on the plate. Uh, Dingle? <clears throat> he says he found it swirling in an eddy by the inlet up there. Brought it home for a decoration. A decoration? I was about to ask this fella if he had ever considered a nice watercolor painting or maybe a bowl of wax fruit or a potpourri dish. But considering the state of the man's home, I suppose a head may be as good as anything else. Yeah, you know, let me calm your hand up a little bit, man. I'm a little mixed up. Mm, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look good, that boy. Look at that. Look good. Mm. The man took a little comb out of his pocket and commenced to neaten the head's hair. Hmm. Sir, the deputy and I have reason to believe this man whose head you came across was the victim of a murder. Would you happen to know who the man is? Hmm. Oh, the killer of the head. What'd he say, deputy? He said, does he know who? The head or the murderer? Well, either one would be pretty helpful, I suppose. 
Oh, we never heard a little thought about that, there, boy. You know, when you go out, I need a pray. I need a little you know, put him on a plate, and his name is Clarence. He says he never gave much thought to it, but the head's named Clarence. Clarence? Clarence. How about the last name? Oh, I don't think I want to have a last name. Come on, he's out there, boy. Oh, uh, uh, he doesn't know the real name, Sheriff. He just decided to call it Clarence. Hmm, and my dead Uncle Clarence, hmm. After his deceased Uncle Clarence. Hmm. Well, I'm sorry to hear about your uncle, Mr. Yurt fella, but I'm afraid the deputy and I are going to have to confiscate Clarence here for evidence in this murder case. This seemed to upset the man a little. He now held the head like a French sommelier whose bottle of wine I'd just insulted. Well, you see, mister, I'm not normally in the business of confiscating people's decorations, but you have to understand, being the deputy and I have a mystery to solve, and whose head that is has quite a bit to do with it, it's exactly the bit of evidence I think we need. Ain't that right, deputy? I suppose so, sheriff. Oh, look at him. Y'all ain't coming around here on that my shit. Hmm, I'll say fuck you. The yurt fella didn't seem happy about relinquishing his decoration especially after inviting the two of us into his home. Well, I'm afraid we have no choice, sir. Clarence here is not only an important piece of evidence, but our only witness to the crime. The deputy and I need to take him down to the lab and retrieve his last memories with our special forensic supercomputer. And when we find the murderer, sir, undoubtedly you'll be hailed as a hero all over Split Tail, perhaps even worldwide. Now, doesn't that sound nice, mister? Isn't that just as nice as nice can get? My premise may have been embellished a little, but I think the man liked the idea of becoming a hero. Along with that, being he thought the deputy and I meant to chronicle this man's final moments in high technicolor, we could safely set the man aside as a suspect. I'm sure that there's laws on the books regarding the keeping of a man's head, or even decorating one's yurt with it but these were small potatoes compared to the big one bobbing downstream. And if there's one thing I've learned in all my decades of law enforcement, it's this. Stick to the big potatoes, because everyone's got small ones, and there just ain't enough time in the day to deal with them all. Deputy, go ahead and take Mr. Clarence there into custody. What? Uh, how am I supposed to? Well, I wouldn't worry about cuffing him, Deputy, mostly because he's deceased but also that he's got no arms. You mean you want me to just... Just pick him right up, deputy. Can't be more than a couple of pounds. I tap my badge to remind the deputy why he had to do all the gross stuff, and I didn't. And sulking the whole time, he tried deciding the least objectionable way to pick up Clarence. By the ears? With your fingers in his nose like a bowling ball? In the end, he turned it facing away from him and held it by the hair. Mothering the whole time how undignified it was, etc. Now hold on there, hold on there. What's that, Mr. Yurt person? He says to hold on a second. He reached under the dead fella's neck and peeled away what looked like a fancy doily. This he put back on the plate and set the plate back in the heap. With a mutual nod, it seemed we were all squared up. Thank you, Mr. Yurt fella. There's no doubt at all you've been inscribed in the book of life for your deeds here today. Nor is there any doubt that every eligible woman in Split Tail will be knocking on your yurt once they hear who's the hero who helped us catch the Clarence killer. The yurt fella beamed in reverie, and the deputy and I took our leave. The fetid bog water aroma of the fishing hole was a welcome relief to the tent. Even the smell of the thing sizzling in the frying pan was a relative pleasure. Dingle walked with Clarence held out in front of him like Perseus holding Medusa's head. You, uh, really think he'll get lots of girls, Sheriff? Once we find the killer? Well, I don't know about that, Deputy. Not in the sense you might be thinking. But if there's one thing I've learned in all my decades of law enforcement, it's this. The end always justifies the means. Now, I had no idea at all what the end of this was going to be, only that whatever meanness we got up to along the way would easily be justified by it.
You know, if there's just one thing I've learned in all my decades of law enforcement, it has to be this. Once you drop your lead in the water, you never do know what you're going to catch. But now with our first piece of evidence sitting in the deputy's lap, we could at least be sure where we were headed. Even though I wasn't sure at all where we were headed, only that we had a head with us, and in some metaphorical way, that must have been pointing us in the right direction. We had our line in the water, and eventually, we were bound to catch something. Can I put this in the back seat, Sheriff? Maybe in the trunk? No, Deputy. We can't have it rolling around, bumping into stuff, picking up all kinds of fibers and whatnot. We gotta keep Clarence here looking his best. That way, hopefully someone will recognize him. I reached over and patted Clarence on the head, mostly on account of that was the only place you could pat him. It wasn't long before my stomach started growling, and therefrom spawned what I thought was a pretty darn good idea. If there was one place in Split Tail Clarence had showed his face at one time or another, where was that likely to be? Not the more specialized establishments like Split Tail Osteopathy or the Putt-Putt, for instance. We had no evidence Clarence was into massage or mini-golf, not by looking at him at least. But what was something that everybody liked? The answer was simple. Pizza. You'd be hard-pressed to find someone who didn't. Harder pressed than Dingle's tan slacks. It was at that moment I realized I'd make one hell of a detective. And to that end, I went ahead and promoted myself to detective. Maybe it wasn't a promotion from sheriff per se, but I went ahead and added the title to my credentials. Dingle I made a deputy detective, even though I'm not sure there is an actual thing as that. Even if there was, I doubted he could pass the exam. Still, he seemed pleased to hear it. If there's one thing I've learned in all my professional experience, it's this. Recognition is a powerful motivator. Outside Split Tail Pizza, I decided the deputy detective just holding the head by the hair looked a little indiscreet. I took an old pizza box off the top of the garbage can, and it didn't look too greasy inside, so we went ahead and put Clarence in it. It didn't close right, so he kind of had to pinch it shut and just hold it that way. To be far, they never really designed pizza boxes for this purpose. Inside, I ordered a couple slices for myself. The deputy detective might have wanted one too, but he was busy holding Clarence, so his hands were full for now. Working on my second slice, I approached the counter with the deputy detective at my side. The pizza guy was doing his frisbee tricks with the dough. Mr. Pizza Fella, I said, I'm High Sheriff Detective Ball, and this here's Deputy Detective Dingle, Split Tail PD. We were hoping to ask you a couple questions. The pizza fella dropped his dough on a wooden pill. Questions? I haven't done anything wrong, have I? No, Mr. Pizza Fella, but someone sure as hell did, and the deputy detective and I are on their trail, looking to throw the bracelets on him and toss them in the cooler. But what we need to know first is if you've ever seen this fella we've got right here. Deputy? I had deputy put the box up on the counter and lift the lid a little. Not so much as to ruin the whole lunch atmosphere, just enough to let him have a looky. Hey, what the fuck? The pizza man said. You too fucking crazy? Why the fuck you bring that in here? Well, I had to make sure you had a good look at it. Seems to me like the pizza shop's a place just about everyone comes by from time to time. Figure you must have come across this fella. At least once or twice. You couldn't just fucking take a picture of it? Get it the fuck off of my counter! The man was holding his hands against his chest, protecting his pizza makers, like he thought I was going to ask him to touch it or something. But of course, I'd never allow that, because that would amount to tampering with the evidence. Well now, I said, I suppose maybe we could have just taken a picture of it, but that wouldn't be a very flattering picture. Now would it, Deputy Detective? Well, I guess not, Sheriff. That's right. So before we go taking glamour shots of our friend here, Let's just try and figure out who he is. So, do you recognize this man, Mr. Pizza Fella? Have a real good looky. Lift the lid a little more, Deputy. Reluctantly, the man had a looky. Clarence wasn't looking his best, but I figured you'd know the guy by looking at him. 
He had a funny kind of nose. Not overly funny, but one you'd probably remember. Like he'd been napping on some diamond plate and somebody stepped on the back of his head. Nah, never fucking seen him. Now get him the fuck off of my counter. Not once? Not ever. I never forget a face. And that's fucking unfortunate, because I'd sure like to forget this one. I started to walk out then, but I've seen enough episodes of Columbo to know you're supposed to ask just one more question once your suspect thinks you're leaving. Uh, just one more thing, Mr. Pizza Fella. What? Uh, you mentioned just a minute ago that you've never seen this man in your pizza shop. Just making sure. You certain about that? I already told you, I've never seen him. Now get the hell out of my store before I call the goddamn cops! Well, that was enough convincing for me. On top of the fact he forgot to charge me for my two slices, I was about as convinced as I was going to get. I had Dingle squish the box back shut, and we left and got back in the car. Hmm, where to now, deputy? Soon after, the radio blared. Unit 1, we've got an incident at Split Tail Pizza. I repeat, an incident at Split Tail Pizza. I keyed up. Got it covered, Frankie. Just bumping gums at the hash house when Dingle here goes ahead and shows the guy's noodle. A pause. What's that, Sheriff? Just a little misunderstanding, Frankie. A longer pause. Copy that, Unit 1. I'm getting pretty hungry, Sheriff, Dingle said. We were cruising up Creosote Causeway back to town. A good road to cruise up when you need to do some thinking. It wasn't exactly a causeway at all, and I can't even remember when they closed the creosote plant, but I guess someone thought the name had a nice ring to it. Even so, it was fairly hard to think with Dingle's constant complaining. That's Sheriff Detective Dingle, and frankly I'm surprised at you. A good man's been murdered and all you can think about is lunch. Meanwhile, some hinky Bruno's skulking around Split Tail, with smoke still curling out the business end of his bean shooter. Dingle glanced down at the pizza box in his lap. You saying you think he'd been shot, Sheriff? Mm, Sheriff, Detective? I thought about that for a moment. Could be he hadn't been shot at all. I hadn't noticed any distinct holes in the fella, save the big one where his head used to be. Only I didn't know any hard-boiled detective lingo for someone's head being removed. You know, if there's one thing I've learned in all my decades of law enforcement experience, it's this. Sometimes you have to improvise. Dingle's stomach growled audibly. He huffed. Well, where do you suppose we could look next? I hadn't exactly supposed where we should look next, but I took a minute and considered it. Clarence, besides the obvious bloating, had looked to be well fed. Could be he just didn't like pizza. Maybe that was it. But for a guy who's just not the pizza type, what do you suppose he had most days when other people were having pizza? The answer was simple. Maybe not to your average ham and egger, but duck soup to a seasoned gumshoe such as myself. Deputy Detective, I have reason to believe Clarence here may have done some dabbling south of the border. Take us to Split Tail Taco Shop, stat. Dingle raised an eyebrow at me. Well, you're driving, Sheriff. And it's a good thing I am, I said. I threw on the cherries and put the pedal to the metal. You know, if there's one thing I've learned in all my years of law enforcement, it's this. For optimal performance, you gotta feed the machine. And whether my idea panned out or not, a taco was always a nice idea in itself. The deputy detective and I pulled up to the split tail taco shop and laundromat around three. You could smell the funny meat sizzling from outside, and Dingle was practically drooling on himself. He must have been pretty hungry by now, having barfed his breakfast in the fishing hole and watching me eat my own lunch. But hunger is just what I wanted out of him. Hunger is what keeps a man sharp, keeps his senses keen, keeps his eyes on the prize. And not until we got our prize was I going to let Dingle so much as chew his fingernails. Smells real good, Dingle said. I don't suppose we could... Deputy, if there's one thing I've learned in all my years on the job, it has to be this. A man is a pizza guy or a taco guy. And if Clarence here never showed his ugly mug at the pizza place, 
You can bet he sure as hell showed it here. Dingle kicked the car door open, muttering something about the indignity of starving to death, etc. And we headed inside, the deputy keeping Clarence's box nice and level. Good practice for any pizza box, whether it's got a pizza or a head in it. The fella at the counter looked to have dabbled south of the border himself. And just in case you're wondering, that's no euphemism. That's just to suggest that he was Mexican. Mr. Taco Fella, High Sheriff Detective Ball and Deputy Detective Dingle, Split Tail Homicide Department. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Is something wrong, officer? I have a green card. I'm not interested in the color of your card, Mr. Taco Fella. What I'm interested in is solving a case and three crunchy tacos and an orange Fanta. He put in my order for me, but before he could open the register, I had the deputy detective open Clarence's box. The fella's eyes bugged out like two little golf balls. Do you recognize this man? I asked. I'm not sure how tall he is normally, but let's just say he's about my height. It took the guy a moment to decide how he felt about the head on his lunch counter but I think it was implied he'd stay right there until I got my answer. He said, See, I see him. He called me here many times. I allowed myself a triumphant grin at Dingle before continuing. What do you know about this man? Do you know his name? No, I do not know his name. Never paid with a card? No. Can you please take off of the counter the head? My tacos and Fanta showed up, and I took a few bites before continuing. Let me explain something to you, Mr. Taco Fella, before I have my deputy detective here box up his noodle. There's some hinky Bruno out there, a hatchet man willing to get gas house with any Tom, Dick, or Harry, willing to squirt metal. So before you tell me I'm tooting the wrong ringer, I want you to think real hard, Taco Fella. If there's anything you can tell me about this guy, you'd better come out with it, because you never know who's going to be next to lose his head. Well, that must have resonated with the fella, because you could practically see the hamster wheel spinning behind his eyes. I suspect any man of his heritage can relate to heads coming off, and rolling down the sides of pyramids and whatever. And just like that, he coughed it up. I think the man likes the fish, he said. He has a head with the hooks on it. Can't you please take from the counter the head? The deputy detective and I looked at each other. Clarence was a fisherman. It was all beginning to come together. I stuffed the last taco in my mug and washed it down with some Fanta. Dingle closed the box. Turning to leave, I said, uh, Just one more thing, Mr. Taco fella. Any idea who might want to cut this man's head off and strip him naked and dump him in the lake? The fella stared blankly for a second. <laughs> no, sir. I do not know. Well, you can't call it a trip for biscuits. For tacos, maybe, but not for biscuits. We knew our man was a fisherman. That didn't necessarily bring us any closer to solving this case, but it didn't bring us any farther from it either. What I had found out, though, was carrying a severed head around was a great way to get free food. I'm goddamn starving, Sheriff. When the hell am I going to get something to eat? Now settle down, Deputy Detective. I've got a pretty good idea we're closing in on the hinky Bruno that caused this whole mess. Aside from you, of course. If I remember correctly, you're the one who dredged this whole thing up. You're kind of hinky yourself, Dingle, when it comes down to it. It was your idea to go fishing, Sheriff. Well, I don't recall that at all, Dingle. The way I remember it, it was your idea to go fishing. I tapped my badge to indicate whose power of recall was to be trusted in this instance. I polished off my Fanta and we got back in the car. With Clarence back in his box, the deputy detective and I were back behind the wheel, sleuthing, gumshoeing, hot on the trail of the Clarence killer, looking to slap the bracelets on him and toss him in the hooch cow. Only problem, we had no idea who he was, or even who it was he'd killed. I'm not proud to admit it, but for a minute there, I was mulling over demoting the two of us back to sheriff and deputy. Things were so much easier back then. Back a couple of hours ago, when all we were expected to do was kind of be there. 
And by there, all I mean is we were expected to exist. If only so the fine citizens of Split Tail believed there was indeed some manner of law and order in place. Save the hinky Brunos anyway, and the lousy screws, and the hoods, and the lugans, the snowbirds and the junkies, the goons and the grifters, the tin horn torpedoes and the two bit twists. I tell you, it's enough to make a couple of right guys like Dingle and I stow our Roscoes and scram. But if I were gonna scram, I'd have done it long ago. I glanced at the Polaroid photo I had taped to the sun visor, looking longingly at the couple pictured there. The woman, so beautiful you could find her head severed on a cake dish and you'd still kiss her on the lips. And the man, not bad at all if I may say so myself, albeit ten years younger and with no gray at all in the old mustache. Summer, summer sausage love of my life. She'd give you shade in the summer and warmth in the winter. That's not to suggest that she was at all that generous. Only generously proportioned, you understand. She'd scrammed out a decade ago. Hoped to make it big in show business. Last I heard, she was all the way up in Schenectady becoming a big star. Now that's not to suggest she'd become all that big of a star. Only that she's generously proportioned. In any case, while I was driving along just then, lamenting lost love, reconsidering career choices, I noticed something else stuck in the sun visor that lit up my light bulb. My old fishing license. It lit up my light bulb for a couple of reasons. One, because I realized I hadn't re-upped my own fishing license since the Carter administration. But two, because maybe that's exactly what the fella was doing when someone decided to kill him. It would have been easier to kill a fella by the fishing hole and just dump him right into it, rather than kill him somewhere else and drag him there, especially in this kind of heat. And if that were the case... Detective Dingle, what do you think's the likelihood Clarence here was fishing at the time of the murder? Well, I'd say that's a strong possibility, Sheriff. Then what would you say is the likelihood this fella visited split tail bait tackling haircuts on the morning of the murder? Dingle rolled that around in his mind for a moment, then gave me a rather sleuthy nod of approval. It was settled. Our next lead. The deputy detective and I pulled up the split tail bait tackling haircut just past four. The muggy afternoon mixed with the earthy redolence of worm dirt and stink bait and the tang of barbicide. The pizza box in Dingle's lap looked to be on its last legs. There was a wet spot blossoming on the top of it where Clarence's head wanted to come through. And if it weren't for the wax paper underneath, it probably have soaked right through the bottom. To be fair, this was no margarita. There was a Clarence Supreme in that box, and I meant to find out just who ordered it. And I'm not even sure that last line made sense. But I tried a few others, and this one came out ahead. No pun intended. The man at the counter was eating soup out of the same type of container he sold nightcrawlers in. His eyes widened at the sight of the deputy and I. The inimitable authoritative air only a couple detectives like Dingle and I can carry. In that vein, I left my sunglasses down while we approached the man. Dingle set the box down on the counter. The man set aside his container and stood to greet us. Help you gentlemen with something? Need haircuts? Well, that's a possibility, mister. But before we get to matters of the hair, I was hoping you might help us with something much more dire than Dingle's looks. See, the deputy detective and I are investigating the murder. The man's eyes went wide again. Uh, murder? In our little old town? That's undinkable. Well, that's just what I thought, I said. That's just 100% what I thought, until we went and found this. Deputy? Dingle lifted the lid. Clarence was on his side now on account of the box was easier to close that way, but it didn't seem necessary to set him upright, because there was something in the man's face I hadn't seen in Mr. Pizza Fellas or Mr. Taco Fellas. No, sir. If my police intuition served me correctly... The look on Mr. Stinkbait's face was more than recognition. 
And if there's just one thing I've learned in all my decades of law enforcement, it's this. Police intuition is always right. At least mine is. <laughs> what the hell is this? You recognize this man? I ask. Supposed to be a fisherman. I figure he had to have been here for quite a bit. Not just this part of him, but the rest of them too. And what I mean to find out is how this part of him and the other part of him have become dispossessed of each other, and the sick son of a bitch who made that happen. So what's the scoop, Mr. Stinkbait? Tell me everything you know. Uh, never seen him. Anything else I can help you gentlemen with? Or can I kindly get back to my dinner? The fella had only looked at Clarence for a second or two, not locked eyes on it like the other two had. That said to me that Stinkbait here knew exactly who the man was, and the casualness with which he had regarded it told me even more. Dingle was about to close the box then, but I held out a hand and stopped him. Now wait just a second, Mr. Stinkbait. Uh, first of all, your name's Hinkley. Bruno Hinkley. And I already told you, I've never seen him. Not for bait or a haircut. So, uh, we done here? The deputy detective and I looked at each other. A knowing glance. Because if there's one thing I've learned in all my years of law enforcement, aside from all the other things, I suppose, it's this. Life often imitates fiction. And if the least of all my life's lessons held water at all, this Bruno Hinkley just had to be the hinky Bruno the deputy and I were after. Otherwise, the deputy stood to miss quite a few meals. I cleared my throat. <clears throat> no, sir. I believe you've cleared that up for me just fine. And thank you for your help this afternoon. Come on, Dingle. Dingle squished the box shut and we started walking to the door. But just as we were getting to it, I turned. Oh, just one more thing, Mr. Bruno Hinkley. Mr. Hinky Bruno, or whatever you're called. What if I were to tell you we had video of this very man, with the rest of him still attached, mind you, walking into this very bait shop on the morning of his murder? In high technicolor, you understand. This very man walking into this very establishment. What would you say then, Mr. Stinkbait? Would your story change at all? Because I don't know offhand what kind of penalty goes along with lying to a high sheriff detective, but I'm willing to bet it's pretty stiff. And I'm willing to bet murder's even stiffer. Stiffer than the creases in Detective Dingle's slacks. And the last I checked, those were pretty goddamn... Hey, you'll never take me alive, copper! <laughs> I guess I'd been laying it on pretty thick there because Hinkley's cheese slid off his cracker in a hurry. He reached under the counter and came out slinging lead. I went for my own piece, but realized right away I'd left it in the car. Oh, shit! Fuck, fuck, fuck. The pizza box flew out of Dingle's arms as he drew his own weapon, and I just happened to catch it, just as three bullets came careening my way. And I knew there were only three of them because I felt each one hit me. Rather, I felt Clarence's head hit me three times as it soaked up Hinkley's itty-bitty slugs. The fourth shot was louder. Dingle's 357 rang out, and no head on the planet could have stopped that shot. And this was clearly evident by Mr. Stinkbait's own ugly mug. The shot peeled half his head off, spraying brains and nightcrawlers everywhere. He leaned back into his bait display and took it down with him. The container of soup was unaffected. Well, goddamn, I said. You all right there, Dingle? The deputy detective was on his ass by the door. I think the recoil had been a bit much for him. I'd always suggested he stick with a little pea shooter, but in the business of law enforcement, you learn new things all the time, and I had just added a new one to my list. Size matters, and it's just a shame for Mr. Bruno Hinckley he hadn't learned that one first. Just as shameful as shame can be, because Clarence was already dead, and three little twenty-twos had hardly made a difference to him. As for me, not even a stain on my shirt. Did I get him, Sheriff? I went ahead and peeked over the counter. I'd say you more than got him, Deputy. I'd say you blew the stink bait out of him.
If there's one thing I learned from all my years of law enforcement, it's got to be this. Everything happens for a reason. And why ever Mr. Hinckley decapitated our friend Clarence, I figured there had to be some reason for it. Maybe not a good reason, but I guess that goes back to the parable of the frog and the scorpion. Whatever Clarence did to piss off Mr. Hinckley that fateful morning, you hardly want to piss off a fellow with all those sharp instruments at his disposal. No more than you'd want a haircut from a man who spends his mornings grinding up fish guts. In short, I'm not sure the deputy and I precisely solved our mystery. I still don't know who Clarence was, and Mr. Hinckley still ain't talking. The writing on the wall says Hinckley was trouble, just the hinky Bruno I pegged him to be. But the writing's all blood and brains, and it's not a detective's job to clean that stuff up. Not a deputy detective's job either. I have it on good authority that to do so would be undignified. It was 6 p.m. by the time Dingle and I made it back to the fishing hole, Mr. Hinckley and the better half of old Clarence in tow. Dingle was cranky about having to drag Mr. Hinckley, especially having not eaten all day. I'd told him he could finish Hinckley's soup after he'd killed him, but he was worried something might have splashed into it during the little melee there and decided to pass. In any case, our shift was almost up, and neither man seemed in any condition for a dignified burial. As High Sheriff of Split Tail County, I decided detective work wasn't exactly my bag. I'd made the executive decision to remand both men to the water. Seemed kind of poetic alongside my frog and scorpion parable analogy. Also, easy cleanup. You sure you don't want to give the yurt fella his head back? Asked Dingle. Seeing as the way things turned out, well, I'm not sure we can give the fellow what we promised. What we promised? What's that, Dingle? We said we'd make him a hero. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure we can fulfill our promise to Mr. Yurtfella of hailing him as a hero for what he did, but I'm sure he'll get just what he deserves in the end. Like the great King James once said, amass not your stuff in a yurt by the fishing hole, but as treasures in heaven. So, toss in the head then? Well, I doubt he'd want it anymore, Deputy. Thanks to your friend there, it got a few holes in it. Dingle thought that over for a moment, then nodded understanding. Clarence's body was still floating out there, and the late afternoon sun glowed orange on his bobbing ass cheeks. Dingle put the man's head on his back and we unmoored him. I gave him a little shove with my shoe, and he went floating out into the great beyond. He looked kind of funny like that, with his head just resting on his back, but it had to be more appropriate than sitting in the yurt. Clarence was whole again. Uh, you want to say any words, Dingle? Well, like what, Sheriff? Hmm. I couldn't think of any, so we went ahead and tossed Hinkley in there, too. Now, I know what you're thinking. Maybe a burial at sea wasn't exactly in concert with your typical principles of law and order. Maybe it wasn't so nice of me to lie to Mr. Hinckley about having a video of Mr. Clarence coming into his shop either. But I've been in law enforcement for 20 years now, and like any master of his craft, I've picked up a few things along the way. And like Buddha himself once said, or Socrates, or maybe it was just something I heard in passing over all these years of making things right when all the world seems intent on making it wrong. There's just one thing I've learned, and I've learned it well. And as my own ass is bobbing out into the great beyond, I sure hope King James thinks it's a fair enough excuse, cause frankly, it's the only one I've got. Nobody's perfect. Not even me. You know, they say the true measure of a man's wiener is by the woman who loves him. Now, I'm not sure if that was Confucius or Socrates or any of the other great philosophers of our time, but one thing is undeniable. Dingle must have been doing better than I thought in that respect, because he had hooked himself a good one. Now, good, you understand, is an objective term. 
If we're speaking even-handed here, it might be better to call her a biggin. Either way you put it, it's safe to say Dingle had found himself a stable companion. Now, that's not to say I have much confidence in Yolanda's stability as a companion, per se. Just that if you saw the two of them standing next to each other, there'd be no doubt she's the more stable of the two. In other terms, you'd sure as hell never see them playing seesaw together. And before you accuse me of making the euphemism right there, let me assure you, as High Sheriff of Split Tail, you'll never hear an uncouthness like that out of me. Nor a swear, nor a lie, nor a discouraging word, nor a smart remark, nor an unsmart remark, nor a remark at all, nor a run-on sentence. Because with just one solitary man tasked with maintaining law and order in Split Tail, there's no time at all for impertinence. Particularly when your deputy's spending the day traversing the dark continent, dipping his wick into forbidden wax. And if I had to wager on it, probably eating at the Y too. Doing all sorts of unsavories, none of which I'm willing to discuss here. In any case, the seasons were changing in Split Tail. This time of year, when the humble townsfolk make macabre their modest plots of land, string skeletons to dangle, clicking and clacking from their tinny fixtures in the imminent winter's breeze. When dormant plots crawl with plasticine fingers and morbid baubles. When undead little gnomes haunt their sparse gardens. When chipped and weathered lawn jockeys hold aloft their lightless lanterns and lament their vitiligo. When stuffed soldiers cast long serrated shadows warning away crows with their stalwart stillness and Oshkosh Begosh regimentals over a darkened landscape toothed with cardboard tombstones spray painted silver, whereon the moon swirling in its smoky shrouds brings morbid messages to light. Here lies a man who held in his farts. He held them and held them and held them since March. Yes, sir, that's right. It was Halloween season. Now, that's not to say it was precisely Halloween, because Halloween was a couple months ago. It's just to say most people were too lazy to clean up their decorations. The radio had been quiet that day, and with Dingle having what he called a personal day, and me all by my lonesome, I was feeling a little just like that. Lonesome. I thought I'd pay a visit to Mr. Laundry's new saloon, make sure the old fella was staying on the up and up, the straight and narrow, if you like that better. Because you see, if there's one thing I've learned in over two decades of law enforcement, it's this. Some people, while narrow as they may appear, you can never take their straightness as a given. Some people you just gotta keep an eye on. I pulled up in front of Laundry's new saloon around noon. There were three motorcycles parked in front, which said to me the place was relatively hopping. Where there had once hung a help wanted sign, there was now one that said, Goats Welcome. Now, there was probably some kind of law that cautioned against welcoming goats into fine establishments like this one. But if that were the case, I would not been made aware of it. Inside the swinging doors, it smelled immediately welcoming to a goat. Laundry had quite the ascetic in place. The former shoe store had retained not only its barn door bar and tables, but its original shoe store decor. Here and there, the left member of some long discontinued boot sat on a shelf, used as a bookend or decorated with a plastic daisy. By the bar stood the little black goat with the fancy white beard, contentedly nibbling on an L.A. gear sneaker. And if the FFA certified show goat Liberace had been put upon since that day back at Laundry's farm, you couldn't tell by looking at him. I went over and pat Libby on the head, and Mr. Laundry came out polishing a glass with an old shoe shine rag. Well, afternoon, Sheriff. Afternoon there, Laundry. I just thought I'd pop by and check you were being compliant with all the regulations and whatnot. Regulations, Sheriff? Um, no one ever told me about any regulations. Well, to be honest, no one had ever told me about any regulations either. But as High Sheriff of Split Tail, it wasn't anyone's place to tell me what was regular and what was not. 
As High Sheriff, I was inherently the arbiter of regularity. That in mind, I wiggled my mustache a little, just to let Laundry know he'd better be extra cooperative. Ignorance of the law excuses not, I said, a phrase so old they invented it in Latin. See, there's no personal days when it comes to law and order. Not in America. Not in Latin America. So, when you're ignorant of the law, as High Sheriff no less, well, let me put it this way. If there's just one thing I've learned in all my years of law enforcement, it's this. Sometimes you just gotta wing it. Speaking of personal days, I thought it'd be extra nice of me to update the deputy on the current state of affairs just then. Personal as the day may be, I imagine law and order still had to be the first thing on his mind. Maybe second, in fact. Because me out here all by myself the way I was, it had to be weighing pretty heavily on him. When you really think about it, he must have been worried sick. I held up a finger for Laundry to wait a minute, then flipped open my phone and dialed Dingle. It rang a few times, then he picked it up. Sheriff? Well, hey there, deputy. How's your personal day? Or is that too personal a question? Well, I'm pretty busy, Sheriff. I'm 1023 at Laundry Saloon, deputy. Just making sure Laundry here is in compliance with all the regulations. And I thought you ought to know all about that. Just so you wouldn't worry too much about me, all alone out here like I am. So how you doing? Well, I'm actually kinda... Come back to bed, baby. I ain't done with you yet. Uh, I really gotta go, Sheriff. Well, goddamn. I hung up. It was good to put Dingle's mind at ease. I turned to Laundry. Well, as I said, Mr. Laundry, every business around here has to stay in compliance with regulations. Now, I'm not going to tell you I know all the regulations by heart, because I guess I probably don't. But if there's one thing I've learned in all my years of law enforcement, it's this. The police instinct is always correct, and I know what's regular and what's not when I see it. We both glanced down at Liberace then. The goat bleated. Hmm, nothing against your nice goat here, Mr. Laundry, but this is going to cost you $10 or the equivalent. Oh, uh, the equivalent? Sheriff? Well, I'm not trying to run you out of town, Laundry. I'm far too benevolent for that. I'm only suggesting my benevolent willingness to accept a beer in lieu of said penalties. And maybe an order of mozzarella sticks. Oh, the equivalent. Well, naturally, Sheriff. I patted Liberace on the head while he chewed his sneaker and Laundry went off to fetch me a beer. Now, before you go accusing me of drinking on the job, let me shut that down real quick. Because a couple of right guy lawmen like me and Dingle, well, me anyway, you'd sooner catch me wearing a tutu than to lose charge of my faculties. And that's to say, you just wouldn't see it. I don't know about Dingle, but that sure as hell goes for me. Just then, that's when I noticed a cluster of fellas sitting at the table on the other side of the bar. Sitting kind of hunched over in a way a cluster of fellas might do, under their personal little cloud of cigarette smoke glowing funny colors from the neon boot sign that said open, which I noted as another violation, seeing as the sign was inside and clearly a redundancy. Here you go now, Sheriff, Laundry said. My apolog- apolog- sorry for the violation. He uncapped and handed me a green bottle. The fumes emanating from within smelled like a skunk's underpants, but I couldn't be bothered with quality assurance at the moment. There was something hinky about that cluster of fellas over there, and as the lodestar of justice in these parts, I guessed it was my duty to go over and have a looky. I pulled out my fancy cell phone and dialed the deputy. It rang three times and he picked it up. What, Sheriff? Deputy. I've got some hinky-looking Brunos at 12 o'clock. I'm going in to investigate. Just wanted to keep you informed, just in case you were getting worried about me out here all by myself. So don't worry at all, Deputy. The Lodestar of Justice shines bright. Baby, is that the Sheriff again? Ain't you tell him you was busy? The sheriff, I really gotta go. Worry not, Fire Deputy. You know, if there's one thing I've learned all these years, it's... Well, the phone went dead just then. 
The signal around here can be tenuous at times. I approached the table, unsurprised to see the men were playing cards. Texas hold them by the look of it. There was a small pile of money between them, which was indicative these fellas were either going over their joint finances or gambling. Well, hey there, gentlemen, I said. You know, I couldn't help but notice you fellas were playing cards there. I also couldn't help but notice there was a little bit of money on the table there, too. Now, I'm ashamed to admit it, but I nearly thought for just a second the three of you might be gambling. But only for a second, you understand, because that would be illegal. And you fellas just look so darn refined and sophisticated and downright law-abiding. It seemed to me that'd just be completely impossible you three would do something like that. And I thought to myself, well, there's just no way on God's green earth you were breaking the law. All three of you at once, furthermore, because that would be just unthinkable, especially in a nice little town like this. All three men glared at me just then, and I don't believe I recognized any one of them. The two looked a little like Hall and Oates. Only if Hall had spent a few years in the can and Oates right along with them. And the third fella might have been Oates' little brother, only with the skull tattooed on his neck. Something I wouldn't expect from Oates' little brother, if he did indeed have one, that is. Come to think of it, maybe they didn't really look like Hall and Oates at all. But then the Hall one turned his cards face down and kind of raised an eyebrow at me. You got a whole lot of nerve, he said. You know, the last time I went mano a mano with one of you goons, I had him dancing on his knees. So can the war of words and tell me what you want. Well, talk about being out of touch. You know, if there's one thing I've learned in all my years of law enforcement, it's this. Crime pays, which is pretty much why people do it. But what did I want, he asked. All I'd hoped for was to check in on old Mr. Laundry and test a few mozzarella sticks. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure this is about what I want, Mr. Card Shark. It's more about what I do. You some kind of local yokel or something? <laughs> this earned a few chuckles from the rest of the band, <laughs> and suddenly I knew what Dingle meant by the word undignified. Well, goddamn, I said. Can't you tell by my outfit what I am? I mean, I thought for just a second that you two were hauling notes, but then I saw your outfits and I thought to myself, now those two probably aren't hauling notes at all. So, the way I see it, you should all be able to tell by my outfit that I'm High Sheriff of Split Tail. Could be a silly costume. <laughs> the oats looking guy said, That's right, said Hall. Maybe like the rest of this shit old town. You seem to think it's still goddamn Halloween and shit. Well, I suppose it could be, I said. I suppose that's truly a possibility, even though this here is a genuine zinc aluminum alloy badge, and you'd be hard-pressed to find one of those at a costume shop. Harder-pressed than Dingle's tan pants. Just the mention of Dingle made me remember he wasn't with me. Reminded me I was on my own, just a lone star in the night sky, immersed in the darkness. Which was ironic, because Dingle was probably immersed in the darkness himself, drilling for rare earth minerals in the forbidden preserves of Yolanda. And I pictured his tan pants would need to be pressed again before he were even much help to me. You got a lot of nerve, Hall said, coming in here with your alloy badge and your outfit. You know, the last time one of you county mounties tried to bust up my game, I gave him grounds for separation. I can't go for that, you understand? Well, hold on, Mr. Card Shark there. I'm not making a formal accusation you three are gambling illegally in Mr. Laundry's saloon here. Same as I'm not accusing you and you there of being hollow notes. I'm merely suggesting it appears that way. And last I checked, a little clarification on the matter is pretty well within my purview. The three men shot me a look at once, and I imagined what Gomez must have felt like when Bill Murray and the other two shot their lasers at him. Hall spoke up. I don't know nothing about a purview, Mr. High Sheriff City Kitty. 
Around here, it's pay to play. So the way I see it, you got two choices. Try your luck going through the motions. Or sit your ass down and pony up. Do what you want. Be who you are. But whichever way you choose, I'm watching you. Well, at that moment, I was glad I'd left my shades down. Now, I'm not a proud man, mind you, but I am just about the finest, most diligent, most upstanding officer of the law you can find. And if all my years as such have taught me just one thing, it's this. Sometimes you have to pivot a little to get to where you mean to go, even if you're not quite sure where that is. So what's it gonna be, High Sheriff of Split Tail? You want in? Or are the two of us gonna head outside and walk our twenty paces? Well, goddamn, I said. You saying you wanna challenge me to a duel? Some things are better left unsaid. He pulled a seat out from the table and turned it toward me a little. Twenty bucks to buy in. 20 paces to buy the farm. <laughs> <laughs> Chuckles all around. None for me, mind you, because there's nothing all that funny about this level of hinkiness in a nice place like Split Tail. A place whose welcome sign declares Split Tail, an upstanding community. And furthermore, underneath where it says, public officials prohibited from dueling. That in mind, I found myself in a sticky situation. So I set my skunky beer on the table and sat down. I fished a 20 out of my pocket and tossed it on the pile. Hall gave me a hinky little grin. His teeth looked like he had had the same diet as Laundry's goat. He slid me a stack of chips. No limit hold'em's the game. Auntie's a buck. And just like that, I'd become filthy. You know, if there's one thing I've learned in my years of public service, it's this. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Laundry came sauntering over just then with a tray of refreshments, including my mozzarella sticks. He seemed surprised at first, then relieved when he saw the chips in front of me. Well, I'll be Sarah, and I was worried you were going to give them trouble. Them and me both. Now, now, Mr. Laundry. Now, why would I do something like that over something as harmless as a little card game? It ain't like these fellas are making any trouble, are they? Putting upon your goat or whatnot? Well, no, Sheriff. There's nothing at all like that. It's just a little harmless card game, like you said. Hell, if it weren't for me allowing a card game every once in a while, I'm not sure anyone would come by her at all. I'd go right out of... I'd go right out of business. <laughs> the goat bleated in agreement. Moses' little brother finished shuffling the cards. He dealt out two to each of us, face down. Then he cut the deck and burned one. Then he threw down the flop. Three of hearts, five of hearts, and an ace of clubs. The men thumbed up their cards and had a little looky. I had a looky at my own. A four and a six, both hearts. Well, goddamn, I said, and the three men leveled their eyes on me like I'd just coughed up a coronavirus. My intuition says you've got a lot to lose, the hall guy said. Not one for foolish pride. That right? Well, I wasn't about to say if it was or it wasn't. And with my shades down the way they were, there was nothing to see in the mirrored lenses but their own dumbfoundedness. Meanwhile, Oates tossed in two chips, and then it was to me. I took another little look under my cards, then went ahead and matched him. All and What's-His-Face did too. What's-His-Face turned over the next card, an ace of spades. I watched everyone check their cards again. Could be one of them had an ace himself. Could be all of them did. Hmm. If there's one thing I'd learned in all my years of law enforcement, it you never can tell what a fella's got up his sleeve. And that goes double for a fella like these three. Oates pushed a whole bunch of chips in then. He counted them up and made two piles of five. 
ten dollars. Enough for a beer and a sandwich, or an osteopathic massage. Righteous bucks. Heh, <laughs> that's ten to you there, Mr. High Sheriff. <laughs> well, goddamn, I said. Give me just a second, would you? I pulled out my phone and called Dingle. It took him a few rings, but that's probably because he was having such a personal day and all. <clears throat> Sheriff? Well, hey, Dingle. Just a little question for you. Say there's a three of hearts, a five of hearts, and an ace of clubs on the table. And some hinky-looking fellas bet ten bucks he's got a better hand than you do. How would you handle that, deputy? You playing poker, Sheriff? Well, I figure since you're doing all sorts of poking today, deputy, poking and prodding and probably eating at the Y, too, I figured I might as well have some fun myself. What the hell he just say, baby? Nothing. Well, what kind of hand you got? Well, I can't tell you that, Dingle. If I tell you what kind of hand I've got, then all these fellas here will hear me say it. And then they'll know what kind of hand I've got. The men were glaring at me so close now, I thought I knew what a shaven mirror felt like. Well, then why are you bothering me, Sheriff? This is supposed to be my personal day. Well, there's ten clams on the line here, Dingle. Maybe that's not a whole lot to you, being a big shot deputy and all, but I'm just a lowly high sheriff out here all by myself. A man estranged. A man forsaken. Can't you turn off that phone, baby? Bits to you, city kitty, said the hall-looking fella. Now you just wait a second, Mr. Card Shark, while I consult with my... Then wouldn't you know it, the line went dead again. I put the phone back in my pocket, wiggled my mustache to recenter myself. A man abandoned. Well, goddamn... I muttered. We don't got all day, Barney, said the hall-looking fella. You in or you out? Well, completely surrounded by no help at all this particular day, I had nothing to rely on but my own police intuition. You know, if there's one thing I've learned in all my years of law enforcement experience, it's this. Sometimes a man's got to make his move. I'm all in, I declared and nudged my chips forward. Then for effect, I stuck a mozzarella stick in my teeth like a cigar. Somewhere on the high seas, a ship sailed. A solitary star blazed in an empty sky. A lone wolf howled at the moon. A goat bleated. That last one was Liberace. The rest were kind of metaphorical. It was a minute or two before Hall broke the silence and my reverie along with it. You don't got a goddamn thing, do you, Sheriff Smart Guy? Well now, I said, I certainly do have something, Mr. Hucklebuck. I guess it's just your job to decide what that might be. Another pause while the men weighed their risks and rewards. Finally, Hall said, I don't want to play those guessing games with you, Smokey Bear. He folded his cards. The others followed, and wouldn't you know it, suddenly I had enough extra cash for an osteopathic massage. It occurred to me then that I might even have a method going. An M-E-T-H-O-D method. The hall fella glared at me while he put the deck back together and started shuffling for the next hand. What'd you have there, Smokey? You can tell me. Well, goddamn, I said. I've been so busy stacking these chips up, I just completely forgot. Ain't that something, Mr. Hucklebuck? Listen here, city kitty. Hold'em's a gentleman's game. Same as a good old duel. Promise ain't enough. We understandin' each other, Sheriff Smart Guy. Well, I think we sure do, I said. I think we're both speaking exactly the same language. Now, I'm not sure about Mr. Oates over there, but you and me, I think we're precisely communicado. Well, shoo! The Oates fella muttered at his diminishing pile of chips. The third man still hadn't said a word. Hall dealt out the next hand and turned over the flop. A king of hearts, a king of diamonds, and a four of diamonds. And everyone but the silent fella had to whistle. Well, goddamn, I said. I'm definitely winning this one. Since I hadn't even peeked at my cards yet, I guess the other fellas didn't take me seriously. Probably thought I was just some country bumpkin who didn't know my way around the card table. Well, maybe there was some truth to that, but I knew something they didn't know. 
and that was I had a method. So just for formality's sake, I had a little looky. Not that it mattered much with my method and all. Nothing at all, Hall said. That's what you got, Sheriff Shit Weasel. He knocked on the tabletop with his knuckles. If you say so, fella, I said. Although if we're laying our proverbial cards on the table here, I gotta tell you, calling me Sheriff Shit Weasel is bad sportsmanship. Especially when you're sitting right here next to me smelling like a goddamn poopy pants. Hall started to stand up just then, but Oates went and piped in. Shoo! Now there's no need for any silliness, fellas. Let's not spoil the nice game here. <sighs> he called me a goddamn poopy pants. Well, let's just settle down. No sense being silly. The goat bleated across the room. Hall slowly sat down, keeping a stinky eye on me the whole time. What's-his-face took another look at his cards and checked. Oates did the same, and when it got to me, I took another little look myself, just to keep up appearances. Not that it mattered much on account of my new method. And in accordance with my new method, I slid my whole mess of chips right in the middle. I'm all in, Mr. Fuckstick. So what say you to that? Oh, you stinking son of a bitch. What kind of shit you think you're pulling? Oh, shoo! He could have a king! Oates said. <sighs> you know what I think? I think he's full of more shit than the bartender's damn goat. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, Mr. Poopy Pants, I said. I mean, that's certainly a possibility, but then again, maybe not. Hall was grinding his teeth now. <sighs> You're all talk, ain't you, you rotten cop? You don't got a damn thing, do you? That what you think? I asked. Well, hold on just a second. It just so happens I've got my very own character reference. I dialed Dingle and pressed the speaky phone button so everyone could hear him. It took him a few rings, but I knew he'd pick up. If there's one thing I knew about my fire deputy, it's this. He's as faithful as an old dog. I'd recently learned a few other things about him, too. But as I explained, we don't have to go into them here. Sheriff? Dingle, these fellas I'm playing poker with right now, they think I'm bluffing. So tell me, deputy, have you ever known me to dissimulate my great natural luck? Or maybe I was just born with a turtle up my ass. What do you think, Dingle? Ain't I just as lucky as luck can get? Is that the sheriff again, baby? Can't I just get some dick in here? Well, sure, Sheriff. I'd say you were a pretty lucky duck. But I really gotta go. Well, you go ahead, Deputy. I just needed a little clarification for my new friends. You see, one of them here, who kinda smells like he did the funky worm through a fertilizer factory, he thinks I might be bluffing. You prick bastard. You're lucky is right. You're lucky I don't. See, he just thinks I'm whistling Dixie cause I went all in on the flop. But you know better, don't you, Dingle? You know I can take care of business all by myself out here. With three hinky-looking bikers who most certainly have guns on them. You know I'd never play fast and loose with a few fellas like that, don't you? Uh, right, Sheriff. That's right. So you just go on enjoying your personal day, and I'll just keep soaking these hinky brunos for everything they're worth. And don't you worry, Dingle because your job is as safe as safe can be, as long as I'm safe, that is. Because just as every town needs a sheriff to ensure its safety, every sheriff needs a deputy to do the same for him. And that's why the sheriff's deputy is the keystone of all law and order. Because at the end of the day, it all comes down to him. I say verily, Dingle, the weight of all that responsibility has got to be one hell of a load on your shoulders. It's no wonder at all you need to take a whole entire day off to roll around with your girlfriend. Doing all sorts of unspeakable, unsavory, who knows what. Well, I didn't mean it to be like that, Sheriff. But I just wanted to... Baby, what's that Sheriff telling you? Why you look nervous, baby? What the hell you up to, city kitty? So what say, Dingle? Do you think I'm bluffing? Here, tell these hinksters here that I mean just what I'm saying. Well, it seemed like the second I asked the question, the line went dead again, and my new friends were no closer to the answer I was hoping to give them. 
just suspicious with their hinky little peepers all pointing my way. Hell, for a second there, I felt just like a purdy fashion model. You're bluffing, Flatfoot. It's written all over your ugly face. I dare say, Mr. Shit Dick, I didn't get to where I am by having an ugly face. And as far as bluffing, how about you see my bet there and you'll find out just whether I'm bluffing or not. Because if there's one thing I've learned in all my gambling experience, Mr. Butt Pirate, it's this. Money talks and bullshit walks. Ain't that right, Stinky Britches? Ain't that just as right as rockin'? If I hold this goddamn hand, Mr. City Kitty, I wanna see what the hell you're holding. You understand me? Now hold on there, Stinky. Those ain't the rules. I don't care what the damn rules are, high shit stick. If I fold these cards, I want to see yours. And if not, well, it's just about high noon right now, ain't it? Shoo! Another silly do. That's right. So what do you say, city kitty? If I fold this hand, you gonna show me what you got? Or are we gonna take this outside? I can't go for that, I said. No can do. You see, because the way I see it, that just ain't fair. Who said the world was fair? The hall guy said. You're out of touch, city kitty. And I'm just about out of time. So what's it gonna be? You gonna show me those cards? Or are the two of us going all in? What do you say, you filthy so-called sheriff of whatever the fuck you are? All three of the fellas seemed suddenly aware of their holsters, kind of shifting around in case things got past the point of hinkiness. It seemed the pickle I was in had gone from half sour to kosher deal, and if I didn't handle things carefully from here on, I might find myself in a pile of relish. Hmm. Well, all right, my odoriferous friend. I say I'll do just that. If you fold, I'll show you my hand. But instead, he sat there studying me for a minute, taking little breaks to peek under his cards and count up his chips. Ultimately, he said, That's awfully nice of you to offer, High Sheriff, son of a bitch, or whatever you call yourself. But I'd rather take your money than take your life, cause frankly... I doubt I could get anything near 20 bucks from your filthy hat at the pawn shop, especially with a hole in it. Kinda chuckling to himself, he pushed a stack of chips forward to meet my own. <laughs> then he reached over and snapped up one of my mozzarella sticks without even saying please or thank you very much. And he stuffed it in his rotten pie hole right in front of me. And it seemed to me just then, my method might not have been quite as rock solid as I had first thought. In fact, I could feel my osteopathic massage slipping right out from between my fingers. Oh, good gravy, Oates said. This is silly. I'm out. And both he and the quiet guy folded their hands. It was between me and Stinky now. And whoever the victor, I had a feeling things were going to get hairy. He flipped the fourth, then the final card. A three and a five, hearts and diamonds. Then he watched my face for whatever he was hoping to see there. Naturally, I gave him nothing. Suck on this, high sheriff. And then he turned over his own cards. A king of clubs and an ace of spades. Three of a kind. How you like that, kicker boys? <laughs> and he watched me again waiting for good old yours truly to concede defeat. So I let a few seconds go by just for effect, you understand. Then I picked up my cards and just held them there. You know, fella, I've been sheriff of this town for 20 years, and if there's one thing I've learned in all this time about dealing with hinky brunos like yourself, it's this. You can catch more flies with shit than you can with honey. And I don't know if that was Confucius or Socrates or Shatner or whoever said that, but... Turn them over, shit weasel. Turn them over and let everyone here see what your sorry ass went all in on. So I did just that. A two of hearts and a six of spades. Now I'm not sure my catching flies with shit metaphor was the most apt you've ever heard. 
But I was pretty sure of two things. For starters, how to count from two to six. And second, that a straight beat three of a kind. <sighs> you sorry city kitty, smoky bear, son of a high son of a bitch. The hall fella stood up from the table and pulled his piece out. I don't care what the hell you've got. Going all in with a two and a six? You think this is some kind of game, Smokey? Well, you and I are heading outside to settle this right now. Like men. His friends there seemed disappointed, but offered no protest. The hall fella was clearly the head hinkster of this trio. And he was the one calling the shots. And without Dingle here to watch my back for me, it was time for me to play my last card. Still, I checked over my shoulder at the door first, because I had a pretty good feeling we might have some company pretty soon. Now you just hold on right there, I said. You just hold your damn horses, because I'm afraid you're the one who thought this was a game. You're the one who thought a perfectly honorable 20-year upstanding officer of the law would just sit down with a few hinky bikers and just play cards like it wasn't nothing. Well, I've got news for you, Mr. Poopy Pants. All three of you are under arrest for illegal gambling, and now you can add a charge for brandishing a weapon at a police officer. And add on to that for public hinkiness and for smelling like a goddamn oil refinery in public. And maybe also for impersonating Hall and Oates while you're at it. <sighs> Why, you filthy, cheating goddamn... And that's when it finally happened. Just the very second Mr. Poopy Pants was thumbing back the hammer on his revolver. The swinging door of Laundry's saloon parted modestly, then widely, respectively producing my dignified deputy and his more substantial counterpart. You alright, Chip? God damn! Dingle pulled his piece out and went for Hall. Hall switched his aim from me to Dingle, which gave me enough time to pull my own piece. It also spawned a fire under Yolanda's ass that sent her into high overdrive, and all of a sudden she was moving in a manner that defied her size. Don't you dare point that in my man, motherfucker! Hall's gun went off, but no sooner than Yolanda dove in front of him. She squealed as the bullet hit her in midair, and she hit the ground like a downed elephant. I felt the floorboards lift beneath my feet. Dingle returned fire, three shots in quick succession. The first hit the hall fella in the chest, the second knocked an LA gear sneaker off a bookshelf, and the third went right into the ceiling. Both Dingle and the hall fella were on their backs. Dingle, cause he couldn't handle his firearm, and the hall fella, cause it seemed he had just lost his last hand. The other two at the table were just kinda sitting there watching like two helpless young hinksters who had lost their big Bruno. Ah, oh, shoo! said Oates. Yolanda! Dingle scrambled onto his feet and ran to her side. Oh, God! Are you all right? Where'd he hit you? Oh, baby, she said weakly. She lifted a shaking hand to put it within his own. He took it. <laughs> White motherfucker done ruined my damn manicure. It was true. One of her long, bejeweled nails had been completely annihilated. Well, goddamn, I said. Did he hit you anywhere else? Ain't that bad enough, she said. Shit cost me forty dollars. Plus tip, motherfucker. At the sound of the motorcycle starting out front, I turned back to the table and saw Oates and his maladjusted brother had twenty-three skidooed. Liberace had been the first to notice, though, and was already by the table, munching on my last mozzarella stick. Oh, oh well, goddamn, Mr. Laundry said. You know, Dingle, the pioneering spirit is decidedly American. Like all those prospecting fellas who traversed the Oregon Trail all those years ago, I can imagine them trudging through the wilds, fending off all sorts of wildlife and Indians, doing all sorts of funny shit. And you know what, Dingle? Maybe they weren't always available for the ones who needed them most. But how can you hold that against them? All they were doing is what their spirit commanded them to do, Dingle. Seeking their fortunes, exploring the unknown, maybe even eating at the Y from time to time. 
He had joined me back in my cruiser while Yolanda sought medical care at Split Tail Hair, Nails, and Jerky. It might not have been precisely the personal day he had hoped for, but if there's one thing I'd learned in over two decades of law and order, it has to be this. The lodestars of justice need to shine bright 24-7. They have to, because among the ever-present forces of darkness in our little town, God knows Dingle and I are the only ones around here keeping the lights on. I guess what I'm trying to say, Dingle, is I forgive you, because all you were doing out there today was answering the call of the human spirit. And you know what? You still answered my call too. Ain't that right, deputy? Ain't that just as right as right can be? Well, suppose so, Sheriff. Even though you really didn't have to be playing cards with a bunch of- But I shut him up real quick by ruffling through the $80 I took from the table. I flipped halfway through and before God Almighty, I peeled off two crisp twenties and handed them to Dingle. Because while Dingle's ass may depend on mine for its very existence, the deputy remains the keystone over my doorway to greatness. Not to say I'm not great already, you understand. All I'm saying is I appreciated it. Well, thanks, Sheriff. I knew there was something wrong by the way you were talking. Well, you've always had an ear for subtlety, Dingle. And that ought to take care of Yolanda's manicure there. Seeing as it was just the one nail affected. A long nail, but just the one. And maybe there'll even be enough left over afterward for a couple's osteopathic massage. Then I considered things a moment and peeled off another tin just to be sure. There, I said, that ought to cover it. Why the extra ten, Sheriff? Well, I just figured with Yolanda there's a lot to massage. What's that, Sheriff? Well, nothing really, Dingle. I'm just thinking in terms of square footage here. Surface area, know what I mean? I'm not sure I'm picking up what you're putting down, Sheriff. Oh, that's all right, I said. And all in all it was, because thirty bucks was ten more than I'd started the day with. There was one less hinky Bruno the world had to worry about, and as far as I was concerned, goats were still welcome at Laundry Saloon. See, you can hardly penalize an old man like Mr. Laundry for keeping livestock in his restaurant when all he's trying to do is get by. Hell, when it comes down to it, there's probably a law against leaving your Halloween decorations up for months after the fact. But if there's one thing I've learned in all my years of law enforcement, and believe me, there are a couple of them. It's this. In the never-ending struggle for justice, some laws are just more important to enforce than others. Finders keepers, for instance, because Mr. Poopy Pants had a pretty nice Harley parked outside, and you can't very well feed that to Laundry's pigs, can you? No, that would be a plain waste. See, we pioneering types have a long, treacherous road to follow, and when that road gets extra curvy, your best bet is to step down on that outside peg and lean right into it. So how's the food at Laundry's anyway? Dingle asked. Well, Dingle, I'm not exactly qualified to give it as a gat rating, but I'll say this much. The mozzarella sticks are good enough for a goat, the decor is great for a shoe store, and if you play your cards straight, the clientele are awfully generous. Dingle raised an eyebrow at me, and for a second there, I knew just what it felt like to be a tricky algebra problem. And that's no big surprise. See, as much as we do have in common, you know what they say about men. Some men drink cheap beer and toss their cans in the street. Others sip red wine and drink their malt whiskey neat. Now, I can't tell you exactly which great philosopher of our time came up with that one, but I can certainly tell you this. I'll give it a good think while I'm driving home on my new Harley. It's a rare day in a county like this one when an officer of the law can just sit back, put up his feet, and pale to chrysanthemum. And before you tell me I meant sail to Byzantium, let me remind you of something. See, I've been High Sheriff of Split Tail for over 20 years now, so you can bet I know my poetry just as well as anyone. Thank you very much, and I didn't mean sell to Byzantium at all. And I know my botany too, 
which is why I was having Deputy Dingle take pill to my chrysanthemums. A rare day indeed. This wasn't to say, of course, that the deputy and I weren't on duty. As the great luminary of this prominent county, I'm on call 25-8, an omniscient, omnipresent agent of law and order. The way I see things, that lady holding the scales of justice must be drunker than Mr. Laundry, because God knows they never do stop wobbling. Now that I think about it, they'd probably stay a lot more steady if she took off that blindfold. Anyway, if it sounds to you like an awful heavy load to shoulder, being the high sheriff of split tail during times as turbulent as this, let me assure you it is. But to whom much is given, much is expected. And that's why Deputy Dingle had to do my yard work for me while I relaxed a little bit and had some lemonade. Untam dignified. <laughs> the radio was quiet for the time being, and the supply of hinkiness seemed to have fallen below the threshold of demand. A mild day by any interpretation. The only sounds to be heard were the morning birds, the ice in my glass, and Dingle sneezing and complaining. Now, I know better than to suggest that law and order had finally prevailed. Even the chrysanthemum bush knows better than that. It's only to say the legions of darkness were pausing to regroup for the moment, to sharpen their swords, to polish their rods and whatnot, maybe even have a glass of lemonade or water their own chrysanthemums. Uh, don't forget those over there, deputy. Over where? Right there, I said. I pointed to the forsythia bush just behind them. Mm. Sometimes, Dingle, I'd swear you couldn't water your own ass without me to help you. Why the hell I gotta do this anyway, Sheriff? You know I got allergies? And why you gotta sit there in your underwear to watch me? Well, normally I'd just point to my badge and remind him exactly why that was. But all I had on this instance were the, uh, <clears throat> essentials. Just enough to make myself presentable before the Lord. Well, deputy, to answer your questions in order, my plants need watering and tan lines are unbecoming. In fact, I've only got these on for a place to hang my radio. And to be polite, of course. Speaking of which, it'd be awful polite for you to fill my lemonade glass when you're done with my... And it was just then that they made their move. Not the chrysanthemums. They always stay put but the legions of darkness. And it seemed my leisure time was quickly coming to an end. Unit one. Come in, unit one. What is it, Frankie? I'm working on my tan. We're getting complaints of a smell coming from the McAllen's place. A smell? You telling me a smell is against the law? Is there even a radio code for that, Frankie? I don't believe there is one for a smell, sir. Well, say old Lady McAllen's baking cookies. Is that any reason to mobilize the forces of law enforcement? Because the last time I checked, Frankie, this was America. I understand the smell is objectionable, sir. Objectionable? Well, not everyone likes cookies, Frankie. Is that any reason to go making a hoo-ha? I don't believe it's cookies, sir. Well, goddamn. <sighs> Something about a hoo-ha, Sheriff? Oh, the McAllen place is supposed to be emitting some kind of objectionable aroma, deputy. Huh. But don't they have like a million cats over there? Well, I understand the lady of the house is an aficionado of sorts, but there's no law against that, is there, Dingle? Not that I'm aware of, Sheriff. No worse than sitting in your damn underwear while your deputy does the- Unit one. Copy that, I said. If it is cookies, Frankie, you can consider me 10-6 until further notice. Because for one thing, that's a substantial redirection of resources. And for another, I like cookies. And you can bet I'll be having a few myself. Do you copy? Copy that, Sheriff. I hung the radio back on my underwear strap and lay back for one last minute of sun. I had a good idea Byzantium was further away than I thought. I just can't imagine why you'd want so many cats. Yolanda's neighbor's got one. I swear I could be lying in her bed and allergic from all the way next door. I drained my lemonade. Well, I didn't know that about you, deputy. That I'm allergic to cats? That she allowed you in her bed. Frankly, I'm appalled. Will the indignities ever cease?
A little morning dove landed on my fence post and took a shit. Then it made that funny sound they make and flew away. Not too polite, if you ask me. But things like that, I tend to take as a sign. There's no such thing as coincidences in this world. Now, the way I see it, everything happens for a reason. I got to my feet and kind of reoriented my underwear for upright mobility. Well, let's get a move on, Dingle. Something's rotten in the state of Denmark. Now, where to put my keys? Dingle just stood there for a second. You gonna get dressed, Sheriff? Well, surely I considered it, but there were two things that had me leaning the other way. For one thing, the greasy suntan lotion I had all over me did not play well with polyester. And next, the possibility there'd be nothing too bad going on. Most likely, I'd send Dingle to the door to check, and we'd head right back here and get undressed again. Not Dingle, I mean. No one needs to see that. Yolanda does, maybe, but sure as hell not me. Now, deputy, we'll just take a little ride. See the sights, smell the smells. The garden can wait, Dingle, don't you worry. Tis an unweeded garden. Dingle shook his head. You know, from time to time, I'd almost sense him losing his zest for police work. Almost. But our yoke is a heavy load to shoulder. Even the greatest luminaries among us will occasionally grow weary. Not me, of course, but, well, you get the idea. We pulled up to the McAllens around a half an hour later, after a quick stop by the 7-Eleven for provisions. The slushy kept sliding around in my thighs and the hot dog tasted like suntan lotion. But the minute I lowered the window to toss out the cardboard hot dog thing, I noted there was indeed an objectionable smell in the air. Dingle did too, and that was plain to see by his cartoonish looking Adam's apple, just bobbing up and down like it wanted back on the tree. That sure ain't cookie, Sheriff. Well, careful you don't toss your own, Dingle. That's just undignified to go wasting a hot dog like that. I had a look up at the door. Three cats looking back over their little tin food cans. Another one pacing the porch with its tail flicking around like it was trying to shake something loose. Another in the yard with only one ear and its two back legs, bouncing around like a retarded bunny rabbit. Hmm. Well, go ahead there, Dingle. Investigate. You ain't even gonna come with me? Well, damn, deputy. I ain't even got my war suit on. That'd be plain unprofessional. I told you to get dressed, Sheriff. Oh, I see. Now you're the one giving the orders. It's the inmates running the asylum. The hens running the hen house. God help us all. It's cats and dogs living together. Uh, speaking of cats, Sheriff, all that cat hair is going to kill me. I was hoping I could stand back a bit and let you do the talking. I sat there playing with my mustache a minute, just going through my catalog of leadership tactics. You know, if there's just one thing I've learned in all my years as a luminary, it's this. Sometimes a fella needs to be reminded just who he is. Not me, of course, but other fellas. Dingle, I ever tell you how proud I am to have you as my deputy? Being so brave and heroic as you are, so rugged and manly and downright gallant, it brings a tear to my eye sometimes just to think about it. How I'm just about the most downright goddamn luckiest sheriff there ever was, it's providential, Dingle. I mean, when you really stop and give it a real good thinky, good gracious, you must have come right down from heaven. The two-legged cat stopped bouncing for a second and kind of leaned on its face in the grass. You mean it, Sheriff? I'm surprised at you, Dingle. Here I am pouring my heart out and you still doubt me. Let me tell you something. As sure as I've shed my vestments and lain bare my soul, I can think of no better man to investigate this matter than you. He sat there soaking it in for a minute, basking in the adulation, or stilling himself maybe. Already little cat hairs floated in through the open window and landed on my greasy physique. I went ahead and rolled up the window. No need to get dirty. Today, yours truly was administration only. Thusly, I sweetened the deal. I say you go ahead and clear the air like only a man like you can. 
and after that, we had to split tail taco and shut that bastard down. On me, deputy. I'm talking ten crunchy tacos and large drinks. Affirmative. <laughs> All right, Sheriff. I'm going in. I thrust out my mustache and gave the deputy a pat on the leg before he got out of the car. I figured in just a minute or two he'd be back holding some cat carcass by the tail. He could dangle it out the window while we went, and we'd maybe fling it off somewhere in Cooter, where it stinks anyway. Justice restored. I leaned back in the seat and watched Dingle navigate the minefield of cats. The retarded one just stopped to look at an old lawnmower, and just stood there for a second with its one ear folded back. Then it turned around and started hopping the other way. Old Lady McAllen opened the door after a while, and you could practically see the stench hit Dingle. He wobbled a little bit, scared a few cats away in the process, but I was proud to see him compose himself. By the look on Mrs. McAllen's face, she must not have noticed the smell at all. She might very well have been baking cookies in the midst of it. Dingle went inside, and I turned on the radio for a little music. Allowed myself a little glance up at the photo still clipped to the visor. Dearest summer sausage, my old flame. The proverbial one that got away. I wondered how she was getting along up there in Schenectady. With all the city people and the handheld video games and the panini machines and whatnot. Yeah, sure, I'd tried looking her up on the computer. But with a name like Summer Sausage, you mostly turn up pictures of just that. No questions answered, and it only leaves me feeling hungry. When you really stop to think about it, the whole damn thing is like some cruel metaphor for life. She had gone up there to be in the movies ten long years ago. I haven't seen any movie with her in it, but to be honest, I haven't seen many movies to begin with. I guess different people have different ideas about what's fulfilling to them. Some people spend their days watching TV and picking their nose and others don't have time to do either one. Some people watch actors playing roles, and others choose instead to play real roles. I'll tell you from my own experience, some people would rather play a sheriff's wife on TV than wake up a real one every morning. To each his own, I suppose. Country life just doesn't cut the mustard with some folks, and with a name like she has, I guess mustard is pretty important to her. Now, I'm not saying I'd never set foot in the great white north of Schenectady, but with all their gadgets and Game Boys and whatnot, God knows you'll never catch me slandering an inch of this great country. But to throw away my birthright, toss aside my divine purpose like so much cat shit, I'll tell you what, I'd sooner lay my prick in a panini press. That's to say, I'd already made up my mind. Maybe I was born to walk alone, like a drifter or something. A heart in need of rescue. Just waiting for love's goddamn charity. Lord knows where I'd found the strength to carry on. But I'll tell you what, a man with any guts at all is just bound to get kicked in on. Speaking of which, the deputy came spilling out the door just like someone had kicked him in the guts. And out came the hot dog right there on the porch steps. Well, here we go again, I said. I got out of the car and hurried over to the porch. I barely made it there in time to steady him before he went over the railing. What is it, deputy? The cats. The stink. Well, goddamn. I only remembered at that moment I was still in my underpants when I saw Mrs. McAllen standing there looking at me. At first I thought she was blushing, but the longer I looked, that was just her makeup. Beside that, she looked kind of pale, honestly. Uh, morning there, Mrs. McAllen. Mr. Sheriff, why are you in your drawers? Oh, uh, never mind, I said. I was just getting dressed when I sensed Dingle here teetering and came right away. But enough about that. How you been? How's the mister? What's that now? Speak up, Sheriff. Uh, how's the mister? Oh, Wesley? Oh, you never know with Wesley. Never mind him. What's wrong with this one? He got the Rona virus or something? 
No, no, he's just fine. Must have been something he ate. Cause there's nothing at all objectionable about this nice lady's home, right, Dingle? Cause even to suggest such a thing would be downright uncouth. Ain't that right, deputy? Ain't that just as right as right can get? Right you are, Sheriff. Oh, well, that's fine. So what brings you gentlemen here today? Mr. Dingle says there's something about a smell in the area. Now, my senses aren't what they used to be, but I haven't noticed anything myself. Oh, I'm sorry. I've forgotten my manners. Come on inside, boys. I'll fix you some lemonade. Very nice of you, ma'am. After you, Dingle. Dingle regarded me unkindly for a moment, but I gave him my mustache look again to remind him how gallant he was. Now, I'm not sure the deputy is precisely as rugged or as manly as I accused him of being earlier, but if there's one thing I've learned in all my law enforcement experience, it's this. We rise ourselves by lifting others. Dingle had told me old lady McAllen was supposed to have had a million cats. Well, if that were the truth, they were all accounted for right there in the front room. And to be honest, it might have been closer to two million. Tails sticking up everywhere. Some of them walking around, others curled into great piles. The floor was basically one big food dish, and there was a big basin full of water where in a normal house you'd typically find a TV set. Dingle's eyes were starting to water. His face looked a little swollen, too, now that I noticed it. See you boys, make yourselves comfortable while I go fetch some lemonade. Fuck stick, shit dick, numb nuts, make room for the guests. She shooed a few cats off a partially buried couch. You too, nutsack. But fuck, get. <clears throat> Those are some colorful names, Mrs. McAllen. I said. Oh, what's that now? Speak up now, Sheriff. I can't hear my ass for my elbow. I said, <clears throat> some colorful names, ma'am. Oh, you run out of regular ones after a while. Tit fuck, butt plug, Charlie, get. She brushed a few more cats aside and made space for us to sit down. There was so much fur on the couch, it might as well have been a whole cat itself. The minute I sat down, there were three new cats on my lap. Even more on Dingle's. A sneeze sent two of them scattering. But more moved in to take their place. I could hear Mrs. McAllen filling glasses in the other room. Bitch ass. Dick tits. Get. This ain't for you. <sighs> I feel like my heart's gonna explode, Sheriff. Aw, oh, Dingle. There's no reason to get sentimental. Mrs. McAllen returned shortly with two glasses of lemonade and handed them to us. There was a whisker in mine, so I put it between two cats on the coffee table and regarded the old gal. So you mentioned your senses aren't what they used to be, Mrs. McAllen. How about the man of the house? How are his senses holding up? Oh, Wesley... Well, I really can't say about him. He hasn't told me one way or the other. Is he around by any chance? Oh, he's here one day, gone the next. You never can tell when... Pig shit? Get the hell off a of fucko. Last thing we need is more cats. Damn it. Sorry, Mr. Sheriff. Quite all right. So you say Mr. McAllen's in and out a lot of the time? What's that now? Oh, uh, Wesley, you say he's in and out? Oh, Wesley's always been a free spirit. He comes and goes. I've grown accustomed to... Dill hole, stop fucking with Buttonut. I've gotten used to it, I suppose. So busy with the cats, I barely have time to... Shit, bastard! The litter's right goddamn there! 
So he himself never complained about an aroma of any kind? Mrs. McAllen appeared to mull that one over a minute. Hmm. You know what? I just can't remember. My memory's not much better than my hearing these days. Can't remember my ass from my elbow. You sure do remember a whole lot of cat names, ma'am. Well, that's for them. Fuck why, damn it. I tell you, that one's always going bug shit. Ooh, that's another good one. I stood then, noted my legs were so covered in cat hair, I practically had pants on now. Dingle's face looked like he had stuck it in a bee's nest. <laughs> well, in any case, Mrs. McAllen, the deputy and I are going to have to take a little look around just to rule out any potential aromas coming from here. Now, for the life of me, I can't picture how or why that might be the case. But this way, when someone calls me up and says something smells, I can tell them, Well, Mr. Mister, it sure as heck ain't the McAllen's household. Because I was just there myself, and it was just as fresh and clean as a daisy. A daisy dipped in shit, Dingle muttered. Dingle, I'm surprised at you. I'm going to die, Sheriff. I think I see Jesus right now. Well, God bless you, Mr. Deputy. Have some nice lemonade. Fart face, get. She batted away a cat pawing at the rim of Dingle's glass. Oh, I'll take mine on the way out. You too, deputy? I don't know if I'm going to make it out, Sheriff. That's my deputy, always modeling. Well, don't mind us, Mrs. McAllen. We're just going to have a little looky. Say you want a cookie? I can make cookies. No, no, ma'am. I said we're going to have a little look around, that's all. You just get back to your kitty cats. You won't even know we're here. You're queer? Here. Well, I said you won't even know we're here. Oh, well, I suppose that's all right. You boys go ahead and do what you gotta... Fucko, settle down. You wanna live outside like two legs? While the lady of the house tended to her hoard, Dingle and I inspected the premises. <laughs> The house looked at one time to have been carpeted, with only shreds of evidence remained poking out from under the skirt boards. A Rubenesque specimen of cat filled the entire kitchen sink, and a runty one luxuriated on it like a feather pillow, lapping at the perpetually dripping faucet. Three others curled up in an empty pizza box watched me defensively like they were expecting me to judge them for it. Dingle kind of wobbled along behind me, just sniffing and sneezing like someone had sprayed him with Agent Orange. Since most of the houses around here were just the same, I knew my way around the corners before I even got to them. The main difference between this house and the next one was precisely what Dingle had noticed. The cats. The stink. Now, a certain amount of the latter could accompany so many of the former, but there was something else underneath it all. The kind of stink that slows a man in his steps, perks the ears up, gets the pupils dilated, puts a deep crease right between a man's eyebrows. The kind of stink that'll make you suddenly aware of your prostate. The stench of death. Follow your nose, deputy. I expect we'll find a dead one somewhere. We'll give it an honorable burial at the Cooter County Cop Shop, I'm thinking. Maybe stuff it in the mailbox for those jackasses. And that'll be the end of that. I think it's gonna be the end of me, Sheriff. Well, goddamn, Dingle. Maybe it's just you raising the stink this whole time. I'm allergic, Sheriff. This has got to be against the Geneva Convention. Deputy, if there's one thing I've learned in all my years of law enforcement, it's this. Sometimes police work just ain't all that conventional. Well, forget following my nose. My nose hadn't worked since the living room. Well, damn, I said, but I suppose it's like anything else. Not everyone has a nose for police work like yours truly. The pantry door hung open, and intermittent on every shelf were cats and boxes of macaroni. 
A mangy-looking kitty at the bottom stretched out in an open bag of flour. By the look of it, the flour also doubled as a litter box. Beyond that was a little hallway, and the cats went up and down it like city traffic. One heavily pregnant cat had ensconced itself on a pile of old laundry and lay there on her side with her legs sticking straight out. She meowed us both a good morning. Shit sticks out of the microwave. The half bath in the hall had no door to it, and a two-by-four wedged in the jam held in that much litter. The whole room was full of it, made mountainous with clumps of cat turds. The toilet must have been shut off because it was full, bowl and tank, both with cat food. A couple tabbies sat perched on the rim, eating, with their tails twitching contentedly. God damn, I told Dingle. These bastards are living the life of Riley. No dead one, Sheriff? Not a one. And to be honest, I can't say whether we're getting any closer or further from it. What do you think, Deputy? <laughs> I turned to look at him then, and kind of wish I hadn't. His face looked like a depressurized sea creature. I'm seeing stars, Sheriff. I gotta get out of here soon. Well, look harder, Dingle. We gotta be getting close. This ain't the Taj Mahal, you know. Dingle and I proceeded into the bedroom. A thousand iridescent eyes turned our way. While the typical stink was strong as ever, each one appeared among the living. I got on my knees by the bed and lifted the dust ruffle. A Siamese fella under there hissed at me. Uh-oh, uh, beg your pardon. Oh, shit! When I turned to look at the deputy, he had a cat stuck to his face. It must have jumped on him from the bookshelf. Looked to be on there pretty good. Dingle started spinning and knocked over a floor lamp. The cat started doing that scratchy thing with its back feet and it popped his collar right open. Deputy, watch the jugular! I considered shooting the attacker just then, but there were a few problems with that idea. First, I had no gun to shoot it with, and second, it was on Dingle's face. But before I could come up with a new idea, Mrs. McAllen came to the rescue. Fuck stain, bad kitty. She whapped Dingle's head with a spatula, and the cat went skittering off under the bed. I'm sorry, boys. Fuck stain's a bit of a dickbag. Ooh, that's another good one. Dingle, you all right? <laughs> Where is he? Let me out the little prick. No, deputy, settle down now. No harm done. You're just fine. I straightened the deputy's collar for him, <laughs> noting his neck looked a little like the devil's tower. I'm gonna expectiate hard, I, Sheriff. No, no. I didn't think so, anyway. But a more troubling matter was that we'd been through the entire house now, and we were no closer to what we'd been looking for. Complaining neighbors are one thing. They'll always find something to complain about. But failure? That's another thing entirely. After getting up out of my lawn chair and coming all this way, that was a pretty tough pill to swallow. In fact... I'd rather lay my prick in the panini press. Mrs. McAllen, at the risk of a minor uncouthness, I'm going to have to level with you for a minute. The deputy and I suspect one of your cats may have passed away. And though we keep searching for an answer, we can't seem to find what we're looking for. Now, granted Dingle has the strength to carry on, I ask you, is there anywhere in this house we might have missed? Well, damn, she said. I'm a murder suspect. No, ma'am, that's not it at all. A cat will die on its own from time to time. Sure as neighbors will be petty now and again. I figure the easiest way to clear the air between you and your neighbors is to locate the source of this past on cat and give it the dignified burial it deserves. Rainbow Bridge and all that. Say again? Ma'am... Is there anywhere in this house we haven't looked yet? Hmm, the basement. You've been in the basement? Well, goddamn. I didn't know there was a basement. Show me the way, Mrs. McAllen. You with me, deputy? The scratches on Dingle's neck had each blown into swollen red welts. Maybe I could go wait in the car, Sheriff? Dingle, 
that's not very gallant of you. Haven't I ever told you how rugged and manly you are? <laughs> well, our Father, who art in heaven. Basements over this way, gentlemen. Haven't been down there for years. Not since my knees stopped bending right. Shit balls, get! The basement door was an inconspicuous little door it was easy to miss. Once she cracked it, however, it was pretty clear we were right over the target. The smell billowing out like the entrance to hell. And I've never been more aware of my prostate than I was just then. Good God, Mrs. McAllen. If this ain't the problem we're looking for, I believe it's a worse one. Say it again, Sheriff. I lifted a hand to dismiss her, then waved Dingle to come down with me. Then I changed my mind and had him go first. A little ways down, I hit a light switch and a dim bulb went on. The moment it did, you could hear the skittering critters and insects down there run for cover. The stench was so thick, I was worried it would soak into my mustache and stay there. And it got even worse the lower we went. A stink so bad, it was heavier than air. I'm not feeling so hot, Sheriff. All oh, deputy. Now's not the time to be so self-conscious. Keeping a handful of his shirt the whole time in case he started teetering again, I followed Dingle down the stairs until we got to the bottom. And once I stepped onto the cement, it was all pretty clear, the source of this olfactory dilemma. Only it wasn't a cat's eyes staring back at me like I expected. Oh, thank heavens. I thought you'd never show up. Gee whiz, what year is it? Why are you in your drawers? Well, goddamn. It was old Wesley McAllen, sitting right there in the corner between the water heater and the wall. By the look of him, I guessed he'd been sitting there a long time. First off, he looked like he hadn't had a shave or a bath in months. Second, he had no legs. The lower parts of him, anyway. Just blackened, festering stumps at the knees. Jesus, Sheriff. Dingle didn't look much better than McAllen's legs. He was wobbling like we were on the high seas. Dingle? A little mal de mer? He all right? McAllen asked. Oh, he's had a hard day. You don't look so good yourself, fella. Mind telling me what the hell you're doing down here with no legs? Well, I came down here some time ago, looking for a bag of beans. Damn cat ran under my feet, and I tripped on him and wedged myself in here. Think it was shit balls, that little bastard. Tried everything I could to get out, but there's just no way. I've been down here for... I don't even know, Sheriff. It must be months. Well, that can't be, Mr. McAllen. If it were months, you'd surely have starved to death. I screamed for days, Sheriff. But the old gal can't hear her ass from her elbow. So, after I got done with the beans, I started in on my legs. Ate those... Ate two cats, a couple silverfish, no salt or pepper. I'm in poorly shape, Sheriff. Think you can yank my ass out of here? I was still staring at the fella's legs. He was sitting in a pile of shit and maggots, just dangling rotten meat like a month-old turkey carcass. He was wiggling around his upper legs like an excited kid in a big chair. It was no mystery anymore what stunk so bad. McAllen was rotten alive down here. Aside from that, he seemed in pretty good spirits, all things considered. I'm not sure I want to go yanking on you in your condition, Mr. McAllen. Well, now you sound like my wife, Sheriff. Here, just grab my arm, will ye? He reached out a hand that looked like it hadn't been washed in quite a while. Also looked like it had been used to pull apart cats and legs and whatever else, and not so much as a handy wipe. Deputy, give Mr. McAllen a hand, would you? Not feeling so good, Sheriff. 
His eyes were just about swollen shut now, and his neck looked like a weird pool toy. I wondered if he was going to make it back up the stairs. Uh, never mind him, Sarah. Uh, you can do it. Uh, just grab my arm there and pull me out. Uh, I got no leverage on my own. Uh, well, so much for administrative work. You know, if there's one thing I've learned in all my years of law enforcement, it's this. You want something done, sometimes it's best to do it yourself. I grabbed Mr. McAllen around the wrist and pulled. He was in there pretty good, I thought. By the size of him, he couldn't have weighed more than a buck forty, probably less without his legs. But once his torso squeezed out from between the water tank and the wall, you could hear the Velcro sound of his ass glued to the floor. I spaced my feet apart and gave him another good yank. The dried shit and whatever else peeled off the cement like an overcooked meal. He was groaning and cursing, but being a good sport about it. Better than Dingle, anyway. Another good pull and I had him free. His legs weren't much help to him, though and he kind of tipped over and landed on his face. I thought I might have dislocated his shoulder. Hey, Eureka! McAllen said into an old carpet remnant. Then he kind of flopped around like a warping fish. Hey, can you get me upright, fellas? Dingle, I snapped my fingers in front of his face. You with me? Oh, Bessie needs milking. Dingle! I gave him a smack across the face. Not too hard. Just enough to bring him back to his senses. He spun around a few times, but when he came back to face me, there was a little more life in his eyes. What's that, Sheriff? Grab Mr. McAllen's stumps there for me. Let's get him up the stairs. Lord, help me some dignity. I could hear Mrs. McAllen upstairs messing around in the kitchen. All these weeks or months or however long, completely unaware of the horror under her feet. And this poor fella forced all this time to listen to her baked cookies while he was down here nibbling on his leg meat. Lord ass, get out of the sink. You know, once in a while, a man in my position just has to pause and try to make sense of it all. Life can indeed be cruel. That all these years I've been saddled with my great commission, and the woman I love is off gallivanting. And here we are, McAllen and me both, just surviving off our own resources. Rotting away. One day I was gonna do something about that, I decided. One day, when the scales of justice were plumb level, and the lesions of darkness were finally brought to heel. One day, I was gonna strike a blow for all the sheriff balls of this world. I wasn't sure when, and I wasn't sure how. All I knew was one day I was going to do something. Dingle, after deliberating how to get Mr. McAllen's stumps under his arms, did just that. I got him under the armpits, and we walked him up the staircase. Whatever mess was caked in Mr. McAllen's undercarriage was right under Dingle's face, and I'll bet he was pleased for the moment his nose didn't work. Didn't keep him from barfing a little on Wesley's lap. But all in all, he didn't smell any worse for it. So he backed out of the doorway and stood in the missus's kitchen, waiting for her to notice. A few cats watched us wide-eyed, then made a beeline for the living room. Lardass wobbled in the sink, but ultimately stayed there. <sighs> Agnes, damn it! She startled when she saw us, and her cookie sheet fell in a litter box. Uh, Wesley! Where the hell have you been? Where'd your legs go? Uh, well, uh, it's a long story. What's that? Uh, said it's a long story. I'd like to know just how long that was, I said, even though I figured it didn't really matter. If there's one thing I've learned all these years, it has to be this. All's well that ends well. You got the beans? Last I remember, you were supposed to bring up the beans. You been whoring again? Where the hell'd your legs go? I ate the damn beans, Agnes. 
plus two cats. And my legs. You ate the cats? You sick bastard? Which ones? Uh, no tail and uh, motherfucker, I think. Well, fuck me. Why didn't you call me? I can't call you. You didn't hear me. Uh, what's that now? <sighs> a great sigh left Mr. McAllen, and he suddenly seemed less relieved than he had just a minute ago. Uh, Sheriff, I changed my mind. Um, maybe he just put me back down in the cellar. I'll get by. Said you want pie? Why would you want to do that, Mr. McAllen? Besides, I think you need some medical attention here. Those legs of yours are a bit outside the Band-Aid territory. Uh, you know, Sheriff, uh, I've been down there so long, I forgot what I was missing. Uh, but now that you brought me back up here, now I remember. Nothing. That's what I've been missing. Nothing. You know what it's like living with a woman who can't even hear you? <sighs> Having to say everything twice? Uh, say again, Wesley. I hate it up here, Sheriff. I hate cats. I hate my wife. I hate the sun and the moon and the stars. Oh, just plop him down somewhere, Sheriff. I'll make cookies. Let me just get the flour out. Ass hat? Get! I'm too old to go a whoring. Too poor to go a drinking. No good news on the radio. Nothing worth watching on TV. Nothing to eat without cat hair in it. And God help you if you eat those cookies. I had it, Jared. In fact, now I think about it, these past weeks or months or however long have been pretty darn relaxing. Just put me back where you found me, Sheriff. Throw down a few boxes of macaroni. I'll be okay. Well, goddamn, I said. Tis an unweeded garden indeed. Unit 1. Come in, Unit 1. What is it, Frankie? More calls about the McAllen house. Requesting an update, sir. Oh, right. Well, I tell you, Frankie, the deputy and I were just there having some lemonade and cookies. And I'll tell you what. Just the cleanest, freshest little house I've ever set foot in. I suggest you tell anyone complaining to go check their upper lip, because there might be some shit on it. That's Matthew 7 5, Frankie. Wipe the shit off thine own lip before you go wasting police resources. Do you copy, dispatch? Ah, uh, copy that, Sheriff. I hung the radio back on my underwear strap and brushed the cat hair off my cheek. I wasn't so greasy anymore as I was dusty and hairy. The car was gonna need a cleaning. As soon as Dingle's swelling went down a bit, I'd have him right on it. How you holding up there, deputy? Fresh air doing you good? I think the stink's stuck in my nose, Sheriff. I may never get rid of it. Oh, just you hold on a second, Dingle. <laughs> I say there's never been a better time to fart than I let him have just then. I even rolled up the window to make sure he got all of it. How's that, deputy? You know, if there's one thing I've learned all these years working together, it's got to be this. Every little problem has a fix. May not always be what you expected it to be. May not always be pretty either. But you and me, pal, we always come out smelling like daisies. Ain't that right, Dingle? Ain't that just as right as right can get? Dingle? Dingle? Well, the deputy seemed to have lost consciousness just then. Or maybe he was just sleeping. I don't know. It'd been a big day for the both of us. And that's the gospel truth. 
Speaking of which, you'd no sooner catch me arguing with Matthew than you would my fair dispatcher. Nor would you catch me arguing with John, Paul, or Ringo. Because if there's one more thing I've learned in all my years, it's got to be this. Everyone's gospel is going to be a little bit different. One fella's going to see this, one fella's going to see that. This one's going to smell cookies, that one's going to smell necrotic flesh. Doesn't mean anyone's right or wrong, only that the truth is somewhere in the middle. See, the scales of justice are supposed to wobble a bit, and there's a good reason that lady holding them wears a blindfold. Sometimes you just gotta hold your nose, turn away, and let people do what they're gonna do. About all you can do for yourself is heed the time-honored words of your mama. Always put on clean drawers in the morning. Whatever decisions you make after that, well, it's not always going to be a good one or a bad one. Sometimes you just got to go through the motions. Eventually, I guess you just got to give up. In the case of Mr. McAllen, I guess he had finally found Byzantium. Who was I to turn him around? I got a few odd looks at split tail tacos and dry cleaning but Dingo was still unconscious, so I had to go in by myself. What are clothes anyway but a micrometer-thin facade of dignity? A lot of good they did Dingle. So, with the Baron, which only a great luminary can carry himself, I ordered five crunchy tacos and an orange Fanta. I sat eating and thought to myself, maybe one of these days I'll drive up to Schenectady and see what's what. Maybe I'd trim my mustache up to my upper lip and get a fancy haircut and a pair of loafers and maybe even a nice suit. Maybe I'd trade my gun in for a handheld video game and learn on the internet about ciabatta loaves and panini makers and coffee flavored beer and fancy teas. Maybe. And maybe Mr. McAllen will grow his legs back because a guy like me, I've been walking the lonely street of dreams all my life. And I've learned quite a few things along the way. I know I don't bring them up very often, but believe me, I have. And if there's one thing I've learned most of all, it's this. People don't change. Hell, if you were anything like me, why would you want to?
tales for dark nights.